Now, today is our final session. We will have lessons 13, 14, and 15. So uh, we've noticed that there have been some technical problems regarding the project blueprints. Today, you should listen carefully during presentation 15, the final presentation by Hui Ya, who will tell you just what you need to do with your project blueprint. But before that, uh, first, I'm going to join Stacy Amling and Sally Garneski on a panel to talk about uh, formative assessment. And then uh, lesson 14, Russ Suvorov is going to talk about how we, uh, how we assess the project blueprints. So talking a little bit more about project design and what you need to do to, uh, to make your best possible blueprint. Okay, I'm going to turn off my video now and start sharing my screen so that uh, we can talk a little bit about uh, formative assessment. All right. So our first session today, uh, we, I'm being joined by uh, Stacy Amling, who teaches at Des Moines Area Community College, and Sally Garneski, who teaches at the Evergreen School in Seattle. And each one of us is going to speak brief, briefly about this topic of formative assessment in project-based language learning, and then we will all have uh, our mics open to uh, discuss with each other as questions come up in the chat. Uh, so let me just get started with a very brief uh, framing talk. The first thing is, what is formative assessment? We're talking about formative assessment in project-based language learning. Basically, if you put formative assessment against other kinds of assessment, uh, the other kinds of assessment are more uh, to at the end of the learning process. But formative assessment takes place during the learning process, during instruction rather than after instruction. And formative assessment can be thought of as assessment as learning, a kind of learning rather than assessment of learning. So your primary audience for formative assessment is the learner. It helps the learner understand how well they're doing as they progress along their way toward the learning objectives. And so formative assessment should measure or let the learner know about progress toward objectives rather than attainment of objectives. So what you wanna do in formative assessment is to assess steps along the way rather than assessing a formal finalized uh, version of your uh, instructional objectives. So, so we do have instructional objectives, student learning outcomes that we want to reach at the end of our instructional process. Here's an example. Uh, you may remember that I talked about a mini project that some uh, beginning learners of Chinese did when they created a, sort of a greeting card online. Here's one of the objectives from that project. Can make comprehensible and appropriate typed captions in Chinese on photos in an electronic gallery to be read by native speakers of Chinese. Captions such as a good place for eating, a good place for studying, etc., along with other daily activities that learners can nominate. Okay, so with that student learning objective in mind, then the, maybe the first thing that I want to do is to assess whether the learners understand and agree with those student learning outcomes. So here is an example of an assessment. You could say it's a formative assessment of the learner's relationship to the student learning outcome. Either they don't understand the goals of this project at all and need a lot more clarification, or maybe they, there are these various gradients of their uh, relationship to the SLOs. So let's say a student understands the SLOs, understand what is expected of them and, and their group, and they're ready, so they could circle that one. There are other kinds of ways to perform assessment than paper and pencil test. And even if it's paper and pencil, there are other ways of assessing rather than doing discrete point uh, answers. So, uh, in fact, one very important tool in formative assessment is that you leave it to the learner to assess themselves. They are the ones who decide 
what their own level of mastery is. So here's an example of that to assess the content or skill that is typified in that student learning outcome that we just saw, right? They needed to label places as good places to do certain daily activities. Well, if we give them a list of 10 daily activities, we can ask them, circle the phrases that you're pretty sure you understand once we've done this instructional intervention. So they're self-assessing. They decide whether they are pretty sure they understand it or not. And they circle as many as they feel appropriate. Uh, also, to do self-assessment for contents and skills, you can have them agree with the student learning outcome, the, the parts of the student learning outcome. So uh, with regard to, I can successfully formulate the phrase in Chinese, a good place to do something, then they decide whether they're not at all able to do that, or they can do it very minimally, they can do it with some help, or I'm starting to do this without help. And this uh, choice of, this array of choices is determined by the goal being that they can do it with help. In other words, the student learning outcome for this activity was that students could do these things only with help, that they didn't have full mastery. And so since that was part of the student learning outcome, the third box that we see is, yes, I can do this with some help. That is the target level. The last box is that they've exceeded that level. And the other statements are similar. All right, in addition to the content and the skills that you're teaching, you may be assessing student dispositions, that is, their attitudes. Uh, so here we see four example statements about uh, you, uh, a point in, in instruction when they have looked at a sheet that they're going to rely on to help them get through an interview. And they are assessing their own attitudinal relationship to that sheet. Either they're feeling completely overwhelmed or they're feeling like, yeah, I got this and I could even do more. So uh, part of formative assessment should have to do with student dispositions or attitudes. Also, you'll want to assess student uh, progress with regard to the process of the project. They have to uh, work in groups. They have to stay in the target language. So here we have um, what happened in your group with regard to staying in Chinese. Either they had to switch to English, which represents a kind of failure, uh, or they stayed in Chinese some of the time, most of the time, or almost all of the time. And also in process, uh, they're supposed to divide labor in their group effectively. So if they were good at sharing, then that, is, that meets our outcome, what we want. Uh, but if one person hogs the, you know, all the talking time, that represents a kind of failure. So this is also a self-assessed item. Now, you don't have to rely on self-assessment exclusively. We all know about uh, more traditional ways of assessing uh, especially language skills. Uh, so here we have a multiple choice question that is a grammar question. Uh, in fact, it's a translation grammar question. Which one of these is the right way to say a good place to eat? Or something like fill in the blanks. So um, these are the kinds of formative assessment that came to my mind when I uh, thought about this topic for this project. And I'd like to uh, get out of my uh, screen share and hand over to some of my, uh, to Stacy and Sally to talk about what they do for formative assessment in their projects. So um, maybe uh, Stacy would like to? Uh, sure, here we go. I'll start my video. Let's see if I can do that. Hello there oh. in Des Moines. Hello, yes. Um, looks like I can't start my video because uh, I think Russ stopped it. But anyway, so um, I tried to keep in mind a lot of those same things in when I was planning my project and in the, the ones that I've conducted um, and really tried to give students the opportunity to self-assess because it does help 
them to feel more buy-in and it also helps them to um, be more autonomous, right? If they can get a sense for what they should be able to do and give you some input on what they can do, then you can also take it from there and provide some scaffolded input to help them continue to progress. Um, so especially the language skills uh, with the content knowledge for me, I think I've kind of tried to embed some of that along with the language. So when we were doing interviews in small groups, then as part of our wrap up, I would have them regroup with different people and then try to simply tell, oh, there we go. Um, simply tell, hello, uh, simply tell some of the information they learned as a way of building in a little bit of extra practice with some of the target features that we were uh, working on. And then, you know, it also gives them the opportunity to con compare and contrast some of the information that they had learned from their target language informants. Um, and let's see, then the, we also, you know, try to build in a lot of the career readiness skills. And so for me, with these group projects, especially I work at a community college, and so I tend to see a lot of uh, imbalance, you know, so the students that are more motivated want to kind of take over and do the whole thing and really trying to find ways that they can share the work and make sure that everyone is contributing equally. So using some rubrics along the way to have them self-assess, you know, themselves as well as their group mates so that I can kind of get a sense of what's going on behind the scenes if they're working on it independently, as well as, you know, as I'm kind of circulating around to the different groups, I obviously can't be in all the groups at once. Um, but um, I don't know if Sally wants to jump in or... Sally, it'd be nice to hear from you. Okay, can you hear me? Sally, did you have any slides that you wanted to, uh, to show? I do not. Okay. Um, you, would you like to start your video and see if we can get video going for um, YouTube? I'll try here. Okay, right, can you see me? No, it says the host has stopped it. Okay, we'll try to uh, fix that just to, just a second. But in the meantime, what are some of the ways that you uh, perform formative assessment? Now well, you're dealing with younger learners. I am dealing with younger learners, and that means they need all the more scaffolding. They need an incredible amount of scaffolding. And one of the ways, primary ways that I do um, the formative assessment is with warm up activities every day. So when my eighth graders arrive in the classroom, there is something up on the smart board waiting for them to do as a written kind of activity and I try to vary what those what they're required to do and it normally takes five to seven minutes but because the kids are coming from multiple different locations and we don't really have a bell system there's often five to ten minutes between the time the first student arrives and the time the last student arrives and this gives them something to do other than chat in English, which is really hard to then get them back into the target language. And uh, they know that every day I read whatever they've written in response to what's on the smart board for them to do. And so it gives me a good sense of where they're going. Um, and some of the questions they need to be able to use language in a way that shows me that they're learning the um, language or the grammar that they need to, that I'm hoping that they'll learn before by the end of the project. But it also, sometimes there are questions in which they're having to reflect on how their group is working and whether things are going smoothly or not. You know, let me try to get this. Start the video again. No, it still says. Uh, yeah, we see you. We can see you now. Oh, you can. Okay. Yeah. All right. Can you give us an example of uh, what one of your entry classroom entry questions might be that they're sitting down to write about? Okay. So one of the questions, um, and I think both you and Stacy touched on this, um, and trying to get everybody in a group to 
um, contribute without one person hogging the, the time. And um, so one of the questions for self-reflecting might be, how do you feel your group is working together? Is, are you feeling that you're getting equal time to present your view and your ideas? Um, they might be asking about how respectfully their ideas are being received within the group. And, or it might be something much more solid just asking them a question, um, how would you ask someone, um, and then giving a phrase of what kind of, where they have to write in French how they would ask someone a certain question, or if for an interview, or for um, we're, our project for this year, we're having um, a, share with a class in France. And so it might be um, finding out from them if they have learned how to, from what they're hearing from their partner class, how they might ask a question in the target language using genuine language that they might have picked up from their pen pals, so to speak. You've just touched on uh, a difference that seems to be coming up in the questions in the chat, and that is, uh, what about using the target language for this kind of assessment? Because when I showed my slides just now, all the slides, all the assessments were phrased in English. Uh, and someone asked, well, don't, why don't you do it in the target language? And uh, that's absolutely right. There are several things at work here. Uh, one of them is that these were first day learners of Chinese. They, were, they have only learned Chinese for one or two days at that point. And so they didn't have enough language to deal with a uh, target language question. So all of my assessment items were in English. Uh, it's definitely the case that as you go, you try to scaffold the assessments as well as the other parts of your instruction and to put them into the target language or to build questions so that they don't, you don't really need the text of the question. It's just a picture that needs some labels put on it or something like that, that they, you don't have to mediate uh, with uh, an actual question. Um, so aside from those factors that um, they are beginning learners, um, I think, you know, the preference should be, yes, it's, everything's in the target language. Yes, for the most part, the questions that I put up on the smart board would be in the target language and definitely the answers that the students would be giving or what they're writing down as how they would do something would definitely be in the target language. Um, so as far as content or skill questions go, that's pretty easy. Um, it's easy for us to think about how to formulate those in the target language. But I think as teachers, we might be less used to dealing with classroom processes and classroom culture in the target language. And uh, if, if Sharice's mic were on, I'm sure that she would agree. Um, actually, Sharice is not here today, but uh, that one of the things that has to happen is that our group process, we have to develop target language skills for dealing with group processes, even though our class is not really per se about learning how to work in a group, it's supposed to be about learning French, learning Spanish, or learning Chinese. Uh, we, we have to try to foster those processes in the target language so that we can uh, stay in the target language maximal amount of time. So um, if you notice some of my process questions that I was sharing, they're kind of complicated, like the idea that one person hogged all the time or that we shared pretty effectively. Those are not things that you would normally put in your lesson plan to teach, but we have to, we have to figure out how to make instructional interventions so that the students know that kind of stuff in the target language too. Yes, absolutely. And it's a huge deal whether someone is hugging all the time or not, which I just unfortunately recently found in one of my eighth grade 
classes where the group was like so excited about the project that one student went home and started doing all kinds of stuff without getting input from her group mates. And then when they found out, they, want, they all wanted a bigger piece. And it wound up having to bring in the school counselor to try to straighten out the disaster that had occurred among their, with their friendship and with the whole work group. And um, it happened very fast before I got an inkling that it was going on, but it's really an important piece. And the only way to do it, especially with young students, is to teach them that language at the beginning intentionally rather than just assuming that they're going to understand. If, when you if you try to intervene or so it is an important piece. I, that's really interesting and it kind of um, shows that, you know, it, that first attempt they made or that, that one student sort of taking the, the, the torch and running with it seems to show that there's a, a pent up desire or pent up potential that, you know, the best projects do access that enthusiasm, that passion. Um, so in a way, it was a good thing. Even though it had a negative consequence, it showed us just how much students can care if we hit it right, if we get the, the right driving question. Yes, I have an eighth grade class that is extremely enthusiastic. Um, they, their enthusiasm greatly exceeds their um, language ability, but um, yeah, it's wonderful. It's, it's kind of like a teacher's dream to have the problem being that everybody wants to do more rather than there being a slacker in the group who doesn't want to do anything and other people having to pick up um, this, their slack, so to speak. Right. Now, uh, from a situational point of view, I've just turned on my camera so you don't feel quite so lonely. <laughs> from from uh, sort of from an institutional point of view, you have students who are dedicated, who sit in the classroom uh, and are in the same physical school, you know, all day. Uh, Stacy is in a community college, and the community college is a very dispersed student body. Compared to a four-year campus, even, there's, there may be less sense of community because they're commuting. Do you think that has implications for formative assessment or for PBLL in general, Stacey? Yeah, I, that has definitely been one of my big struggles is uh, the time limits that we have. Uh, and so I think that's affected some of the decisions that I make about how to prioritize what we do. I've had to really scale back a lot of the projects that I wanted to do uh, for time reasons and uh, yeah and I think it's really hard to try to you know students may some of the students who plan to go on and take more Spanish since that's what I teach uh, you know they also may be more like Sally's students in terms of ready to go and wanting to do so much and then uh, you know a lot of my students are also meeting their language requirements so they, you know, have other courses that are maybe more their core subjects that they want to spend more time on. And so they are less willing to, you know, put in the extra time outside of class. Uh, so yeah, there are a lot of some of those hurdles that have made it a little more challenging for me to sort of take this and run with it as much as I would really like to. In um, my situation, the students are right there in my classroom or right, right outside of my classroom. Sometimes they want to work outside on a couch or a bench. But I can tell if they're speaking in the target language when they're speaking to each other and working together. But I would think it would be very difficult for you if they're doing much of their work outside of the classroom to know if, they're, if it's happening in the target language. Is that and a special problem that you've come across and how do you deal with that? Yeah, uh, you know, a lot of it has to do with trying to reinforce in class, but yeah, not being there uh, is really hard. And even uh, now my job has changed a little bit. I am, you know, I have most of my students are in the same room with me. I was doing some classes where we have like a, 
sort of a telecommunication kind of thing where they attend via, they're still, it's a synchronous experience, but they are watching me and the rest of the class on a TV screen. Uh, and so I can only hear when someone there pushes on their microphone. And so, yeah, then it was also very challenging to make sure that they're in the target language and, you know, doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and really to create that sort of community. As a reminder, if, if you have a formative assessment instrument, uh, in addition to the skills and content, you're also assessing process and you're assessing dispositions or attitudes. So part of assessing process can be during today's you know, activity X, I spent one quarter of the time using the target language, one half of the time using the target language, they can self-assess as to the amount of target language they used, which of course reminds them that you want them to do that. I'm going to uh, take just a moment to share something with everybody because it seems like it's come up in a couple of the participants' questions. It doesn't have to do with formative assessment. It's more about our process so I'm going to share screen, which means that all of us are going to be bumped off of video. So I'll wave goodbye. Uh, we'll keep an eye on the questions uh, section just now on the chat so that if more questions come up, we can answer them. But I'm just going to take you on a brief excursion uh, to last week's lessons. Uh, last week's lessons are uh, lessons 10, 11, and 12. And as you recall, we weren't able to record them in the live webinar. So uh, we had them recorded after the fact. And a couple of questions have come up about slides. For example, the slides that I showed today and the slides that Sharice used last week in these lessons. If you go into the lesson, then under the more to consider section, this is true of lessons 10, 11, and 12, you can view the associated slides by clicking on a link right below the video there. So if I click on this link, then I am taken to Sharice's uh, giant slideshow, which actually covers lessons 10, 11, and 12. And I can view all these slides. Now it happens that Sharice uh, has this set so that you can only view the slides. You cannot save them to your own computer, but they are all available for you to view. Uh, all right, so I'm going to stop sharing and come back to our webinar and uh, have a look at the questions. Okay, so the questions today have mostly been about using the target language in assessment. And I think we've all agreed that it is the most desirable thing to try to maximize the use of the target language in your assessments, but that sometimes with beginning learners or learners who are not yet acculturated to using the target language to talk about their process, such as group work, then you, you're pretty much thrown back to using English. All right, um, another question has come in from Chantal about how long these links will work, how long you'll be able to access these online lessons. And the answer is at least through the summer. Uh, so you will always be able to come back, you will still be whitelisted and able to access this material all through the summer months, uh, and possibly longer. Uh, so one more question has come in about uh, scaffolding ma the materials from last week. Uh, and again, it has to do with English versus the target language. And I think the same answer holds, that at the earliest possible opportunity, you need to try to develop classroom culture in the target language so that you can always continue to minimize your use of English in the classroom. But at, that, at the beginning levels, it's not always possible. And uh, yes, some of those examples were for your benefit. 